Hey folks, this is Ken Carpenter. Listen up, you're uh, listening to me on the movie raid. It's time for the movie raid, and tonight's victim is actor Ken Carpenter. That played in Hellraiser 3 amongst others. Hello. Hey, Mike. How are you, buddy? Fantastic, fantastic. And you've been busy throughout the year. What have we got going lately that you are allowed to tell us right now? Busy writing, you know, mostly writing. And doing a few interviews here and there. I have done a lot of stuff. I've done a lot of traveling with Hellraiser. I've gone to London and gone to Germany a few times. Uh, back east, you know, they go take me out to these uh, celebrations where you go and you sign autographs and, you know, say hi to the fans. But Basically, in the last few years, I've been doing pretty much just writing books on global terrorism, and the series is called Flight of the Angel Chronicles. You know, basically, Flight of the Angel is the title of the whole series, the anthology, and there's six books. You can go to my website at kencarpenter.ii.com, the place to capture me, and uh, the synopsis of all the books are on there. But they're about global terrorism, about the U-2 spy plane, very contemporary stories, very now. Uh, and I think, you know, in a global world where we have dealing with a lot of terror, you know, we're, we're dealing with it almost on a daily basis. So it, it's informational. It's stuff. As your performances throughout career in film-wise, do you think advantage can be a disadvantage despite on the outcome of the project? Uh, yeah, I do. Getting a role in a movie to begin with is luck. And it's usually because you know somebody because that's just the way it is. It has nothing to do with talent, you know. I mean, Hollywood is Hollywood. You read the headlines and you can see. And it's pretty close shop. They don't really allow a lot of people in the door, you know, like they used to. I mean, I came out of Jackson Hole, Wyoming on a, on a Rosalind Russell, Darren McGavin movie when I first started back in the 70s. Actually, it was 69. Those opportunities are not always available to you now, so it's a lot easier. There's a lot more projects, and a lot of kind of, kind of they, they get canceled as soon as they start, almost. Uh, and there's a lot of non-union stuff, and there are a lot of rules for that, and it's hard to get in the Screen Actors Guild. It costs a lot of money these days. So there are advantages and disadvantages to this whole acting scenario. It sure means a lot to know somebody and get recommended because that's how you get your gig. Even if you happen to be, let's say you decide to go out of the game of the filmmaking business for a little bit, and even though you're still dedicated to the craft, but having to go back, let's say, after five to seven years, do you think opportunity is going to be as like a closing window, or do you think you just have to stay active and keep going and keep going until eventually you decide to stop? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's you're as hot as your last show, and that's why people, when they work, you know, it's even big names, they're one movie right after the next. Okay, they got to stay on the headlines. If they don't, they're no longer hot. The salary goes down. They were offered a million dollars for the first one. If they wait a year and a half to do the next one, they get five hundred grand. You know, sometimes that's just the way it goes. You know, they say you're not box office anymore, and so that's kind of the name of the game. It's, it's a lot. Of, there's a lot of controversies around. You know, especially since the Weinstein thing. You know, that and Me Too movement. They've already clouded. You know, the whole circumspection of what it is to be in a movie. You know, and how to get to a movie. You know, the old days of the casting cast and all that kind of crap. If you step away from your gigs, it's harder to get back in, much harder. You have to come up with a very novel project. You either come in or produce. Go from actor to being a producer, which is what I'm doing. I don't particularly care if I act in another movie. I mean, if the director wants me to act in my own movie, I probably would, but I'm more interested in producing it, writing and producing it. Kind of the name of the game, you know, as far as I'm concerned. I, I may have waited too long at stepping out of the acting because I haven't acted in the gig for 10 years. Since you did say it's really hard to get back in there, would they be forced to change an occupation? Frequently that does that. Yeah, exactly. You may have to go into it in, in a different way, you know, and approach it from a different way. Because you may not be offered those roles. I, I remember when John Travolta uh, work, was working on a movie, he got really cold right after he did that, that one. I did a stream of things. And then he got really cold. He didn't do anything. And then he got dirty dancing. Was it dirty dancing? Or it was one of the ones where he is. is, is I don't know if think it was dirty dancing. But anyway, he came back. That movie brought him back alive. He was back on top again. There are other guys. And there's a, that other guy that uh, he got busted in Malibu for drugs and had to go through a rehab treatment. He's now making $500 million. He's worth about $500 million now. So, I mean, you can climb back in, but, you know, you got to know what you're doing. You really have to have good agenting, representation, you know, that kind of thing, or managing. You just get lucky enough to get the right project.
Oh yeah, especially in, in fast forward and now. Like I'd like to think that some of the opportunities. I'm not saying all opportunities, but some of the opportunities are a little bit easier to do, but not exact as far as getting into, but not entirely in terms of television and and any other aspects of things. Especially new territory. I think it's a little bit easier now in terms of getting some of these areas than it was 20, 30, 40 years later because it was so much harder. Because it was all about having to promote yourself a lot harder then than now because you got all the social media and all this other stuff going on now. Well, yeah, and you got an agent. If you don't have a good agent, you don't work. And if you notice, most of the actors that go to the Screen Actors Guild Awards and the Academy Awards are the same actors year in and year out because they got good agents, good representation. And the Academy Awards, as far as I'm concerned, they, they've done themselves in now. I, it's, you're no longer going to even see people watching it. They were down six million this last time in the awards. And it was the same people winning, you know, basically. And then they nominate a North Korean film or a South Korean film. And it should have been nominated as certainly as best foreign film because it was good and he did a really brilliant job but that's not an american audience film with subtitles in terms of your opinion or even yourself do you think you consider yourself an objective or subjective type of actor or your opinion on other actors that should be yeah i, I think well you know i think you should be that an objective actor would be one that assesses the situation of the role i prefer to think that i have approached every role as i i see if i i could try to suit on if i could fit in it you know if i could wear the shoes if i could put the gloves on if i could put the hat on and or did they throw me a gun and say okay practice with it you know in blood games i had to use a crossbow and they said throw it at you and they said you know what now i'm starting to feel like i'm somebody supposed to be doing something here and it was you're out in the middle of the forest well it's like somebody's not been spent a lot of time in the forest probably wouldn't have the, the savvy if somebody who grew up in the mountains in wyoming hunting elk and deer all his life so those things you could bring whatever you can to the to that role and that's what I think a good actor does. They do a lot of stuff. A lot of people like Al Pacino is a really good case in point. He's such a brilliant actor. He, he really studies his material. And he does a, such a fantastic job in almost every role that he does. And, and But but he, he really breathes it. He really breathes it. I think that's important. I think you would have to be part of that. You have to spend as much time as you need to get that dialogue down so you don't have to think about it. It just comes out of you. No such thing as acting. Acting is just performing allowing you to be you know just breathe and, and run the dialogue let it be you try not to act do you think that sometimes going to a higher level of creator characterization can actually become either a bust or even less appealing sometimes if, if you're not careful in terms of uh, balancing out getting the character out as well as get it to the audience yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a really fun story this is a really this is a good show you like this I, I was called in by David Hemmings to do a, a role on Hardball it was a great with John Ashton one of the actors on it that I would have scenes with and we were shooting down in Malibu you know right at uh, Leo Creel Beach when I got the role I went in and passed the casting session and like beat out 100 guys that wanted the role and so I was living right next door to David on the Point Dune so I said can I run, come over and run the lines with you just before getting ready to shoot the next day and he said sure come on over so I came over there and I started running the lines with him and he exploded he blew up and he says he's English and he said get the hell out of here get out of here he said I don't want to even talk to you he says you know you can't show up on the set with that kind of bollock he said you know you don't embarrass me in the network out get go and so with my tail tucked between my legs I went home and I thought whoa what in the hell am I going to do here because I had performed what I thought that role called for so the next day when we got to the set I said to myself man you better do nothing you better do nothing in this thing except run that dialogue and so that's what I did that's all I did was just I let it come out just as natural as I could I didn't try to make this character a mean guy or a bad guy I just let it be me came out and at the end of the day Hemmings called me over and he said the next day we, we shot good and then the next day we were shooting out there he called me in and he said Dick I want you to come and look at something so he took me to trailer and he said look at the rushes I want, to see, I want you to see what you're doing. And I went in and looked at it, and I thought, yeah, I thought it was pretty good. He said, it's excellent. He said, you've done a brilliant job with it. He said, because I wanted to see you, not what you think it's supposed to be. He said, so I, that's why I cast you, because I wanted your character to be forming on screen. He said, you came off perfectly. So he said, a good lesson in learning. He was the best director I've ever worked for. Certainly gave me a good acting lesson, but he was a brilliant actor, too. I mean, that's a good, you got to be scared. You know, I was scared. You know, I thought, man, if I can't do this, you know, I'm going to be in trouble. He scared me into being straight. That's the acting lessons I ever got. And I, I tried to do that every time thereafter. Go and plug in any websites or anything that we can check out 
right now. Flightoftheangel.com or Ken Carpenter II.com. Those are my two websites. And of course, I'm on Facebook and you friend me and LinkedIn. I'm on there and Twitter. I have an account there. But basically, my website is the best way to find out what's going on in Facebook. I can periodically go on there and post stuff. And uh, in most cases, I'll friend you unless it becomes general like it. Yeah, definitely, man. And there you have it, everybody. That is actor Ken Carpenter. Mike, thank you very much.